Hello. Uh, welcome to this hopefully really awesome Lily Show and Tell presentation. I am super, super excited about this one because I do love true crime. Um, so Lily, if you're not familiar with what we do, stands for Lifelong Information Literacy. We are a group of librarians and information professionals, so you do not have to be a librarian. And we work to promote lifelong if, um, information literacy. If you want to know more about Lily, or if you have an idea for a presentation next year, um, starting in the fall, you know, I have my email in my Zoom handle. You can just shoot me an email. Before we begin, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, unless you're talking, please keep your mic on mute. It's really distracting all that background noise. Second, make sure you are respectful to our speaker and to others. Be mindful of others. Three. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat while Sonnet talks. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I will make a copy of them, get to them at the end. And then finally, I want to thank the Lily Web Committee. They're the ones who put together the show and tell series. And I think we've had a really excellent year. So it's been pretty good. Now to our speaker. Sonnet Ireland is the director of the Washington Parish Public Library. She's written articles and given presentations on the topic of fake news, both locally and nationally. Much of her research is focused on ways to counteract fake news through public news and media literacy. She's also a past president of the Louisiana Library Association and a newly elected ALA counselor at large. Congratulations. Having worked in both academic and public libraries, Sonnet is a passionate advocate for all libraries and library workers. All right, over to you. Oh, I was still muted. Okay. So let me share my screen. Can everybody see that? The, okay. So we're going to be talking about using true crime nostalgia to teach critical thinking skills. Um, basically, I got this idea. Um, we were having problems, you know, we're, we're trying to teach information literacy, critical thinking, and it can be really hard because everything is political now, everything. It just feels like anything I try to talk about with patrons, it, it becomes a whole issue. Um, so you had issues with people attending, um, you know, some people who felt like they didn't need it, they knew what the real news was. And, you know, you also had the issue of people coming just to fight you. Um, so we were trying to find ways to get around that while also not sliding into the boring. You know, you don't want people sitting there going, yeah, 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 okay. Um, so originally, I've been doing a class. I haven't done it at Washington yet because I'm still new, but I created a class called Factor Fake, which focused on not just fake news, but scams. And so people would come mainly to hear about the scams and how to avoid mail scams, phone scams, you name it, you know, how to identify spammy emails. Um, and then I'd kind of slip in some, okay, here's fake news versus real news. So I watched something, um, I guess maybe it was a couple of years ago, I think it was pre-pandemic, um, that got me thinking about true crime and how it's, it's a very popular genre. But especially now, we're seeing a lot of things when I was a kid, full disclosure, I'm an elder millennial. Um, so I was a kid when O.J. Simpson, when that trial happened. I was a kid when the Menendez trial was going on. Um, and so there were all these, all these crimes that, you know, as a child, you, you have your own thoughts. You're not really paying attention. You just see the tabloid while you're waiting in the grocery um, or whatever, but you don't really know what's going on. Well, watching some of this information and learning about things and how things were treated in say 1992 versus how we treat them today in 2022, it's just really eye-opening. And I thought, what if we brought that in terms of classes? Um, so I've been looking at famous crimes and trials, mostly from the 90s. A lot of it's been my own interest. Um, you know, for instance, at the time of the O.J. Simpson trial, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it or saw it when it was going on, um, 
I remember seeing tabloids that were making rude comments about Marsha Clark's hair. And, you know, somebody photographed her sunbathing nude somewhere and had that on the tabloids. And it's not something I ever really thought about, but as an adult watching The People versus OJ, I thought, you know, that's really messed up. That was really a terrible thing that was going on. Um, and so it kind of made me look at these other things through that lens. And that's when I started thinking, why not use this interest in true crime and this kind of nostalgia, you know, remembering where you were when you learned about it and teach these skills that are, you know, kind of difficult to get adults to willingly want to learn. So there are some popular misconceptions with these trials or these crimes or these events. And I kind of got the idea of using primary documents to try to flip the script to kind of maybe right some wrongs is maybe a little too generous. You know, I'm, I'm not that important, but at least get people to understand things better. So it started with this law and order true crime, the Menendez murders. Um, I watched it and I remember as a kid, I don't know how many of you were alive for this. These, these two boys, they were maybe early twenties, late teens, one of them might've been uh, killed their parents. And there was accusations of sexual abuse. And my understanding as growing up and around the time of the second trial in 1996, I would have been like a teenager or just entering my teens. Um, it was pretty much understood that that was not true, that the sexual abuse accusations were not true. It was just a way to get out of uh, this murder. Well, imagine my surprise when I'm watching this and they're referencing actual evidence of nude photographs of the boys and all these weird things. And I'm like, that has to be made up. There's no way. And so I started looking it up because I'm a librarian and I take the joy out of everything by verifying it. So anytime I watch a movie, I'm like, well, that can't be true. Oh, it is. That's interesting. You know, so that got me started on this case. Um, and I actually have slides. I created a whole program that I'm hoping to implement now that COVID is kind of um, calming down a little bit in my area. I'm hoping to do this maybe at the end of the summer. But a lot of the stuff that happened in that, you know, made for TV series actually was true. You know, there was the existence of nude photos of the boys when they were young, but the, um, the prosecution argued that you couldn't verify that proved abuse. Um, you had cousins of the family actually testify about knowing that the kids had been abused, that the kids had come to them, you know, when they were younger and nothing happening. So it kind of, it's not this thing that they made up after they shot their parents. It's something that there's a history of them making this accusation. So one of the, one of the slides, and that's why it looks different. One of the slides from the, um, from the presentation is actually, um, the court document where the prosecution is trying to get the nude photos thrown out of the second trial. And I highlighted the, um, the part that I found astounding was that, you know, you can't prove that Jose Menendez took those photos. Okay, fine. But you can't verify that it wasn't a child playing with the camera. Okay, maybe. Or some other person who simply thought they would make cute photographs. Anybody else stunned by that? I feel because I'm kind of like, you know, no, I that's no, just, but that was the argument and they did get the nude photos tossed in the second um, trial. Now, for those of you who don't know, the first trial did um, end in a hung jury. And that was because half of the, tr half of the jury was torn and wanted them to get, I think it was voluntary manslaughter or basically a lesser charge because of the abuse, but the other half, well, it was a whole thing. But um, one of the other things that was very interesting, and I actually went through and listened to the testimony and marked where the pertinent information was, is um, this guy, Andres Cano, when he was about, I think he said he was about 10 and he was a few years younger than Eric, the youngest of the brothers, actually testifies that Eric 
had come to him when they were young kids and asked him about it because he wanted to know if this was a normal thing that happened between fathers and sons. And literally his response was, I don't have a father in my life, so I don't actually know. Do you want me to ask my mom? And he said, no, the younger of the Menendez boys. And so it's these things that you're like, okay, well, what would be his point in lying now? You know, that's, that's a little, um, that to me gives an indication that this wasn't something made up whole cloth years later. Same with a cousin from the other side. Um, testifies to questionable, beha questionable behavior between um, the mother and Lyle, which was another accusation. And then she also testifies that Lyle, the older boy, had said the same thing to her and that she told the mother and the mother claimed it was a lie and shut it down. So you have two relatives, each from uh, the other side of the family, one from the father's family, one from the mother's family, who have these recollections of being told this years prior. So to me, I'm, I'm working on these things to make pretty easy programming for people. Um, and let me actually get the, whoop. oh, it's in my, okay, I'll just close that. So you can see the slides go through who the Menendez are, um, information about the first trial. There's, um, you know, cutouts of the different documents along with links to the whole document. Uh, it even goes into explaining primary sources versus secondary sources. And the importance of contemporaneous notes, like a lot of people don't realize there's a difference between me saying um, something happened 10 years ago and me confiding in someone 10 years ago that something just happened. So kind of giving people that information and teaching them how to, how to understand that. Um, and of course, here I actually have the videos. You can click on the image and play the video. But the part I found really interesting is, you know, talking about how we've changed as a society. So, you know, for instance, it wasn't as bad as it was with Marsha Clark and the O.J. Simpson case, but Leslie Abramson was, you know, referred to as in, in not nice terms. She was, you know, made fun of for her hair. Um, and a book that actually goes into some of the issues um, is by the ninth juror, a hung jury, the diary of a Menendez juror. Hazel Thornton, and she actually goes into how the women on the jury of that first jury actually felt that the boys probably were abused, while the men argued that, well, no, they should have been able to fight them off, you know. So it, it's very interesting to look at that um, expectation. And the good thing about doing a, um, a program like this is you can focus just on the facts. Like, I'm not going into whether I think they did it or not. They did. They, I mean, they, they admitted they did do it. And personally, I'm not saying that they should have gotten away with it, but just that, you know, these, there were circumstances that there was evidence of that for years we all thought was just not true, just based on, you know, what, what media said, what the tabloid said. And at the time, I mean, Back in 1993, like you can see the, the um, Saturday Night Live focuses on how much the boys cried. And I mean, they're talking about things like, you know, being abused, like sexual, physical, emotional abuse. And, you know, it, it's, it's not a great skit looking back on it now. It makes you feel really uncomfortable. Um, and that was only 30 years ago. But you can also talk about it in terms of social issues like rape. You can talk about it in terms of, you know, sexual abuse, in terms of physical abuse. Um, and of course, I have all my citations and some resources that people can focus on. But so this is what I've been working on, making these kind of classes to, and I mean, of course, sexual abuse is not exactly 
something everybody wants to talk about, but you know, it's an option to present this information in a way that gets you thinking about how we treat certain people, how we treat certain instances of abuse, um, and especially back in the late 80s, early 90s. I mean, the idea of, you know, men being raped was even harder for um, survivors to deal with than it is today, if you can imagine. So I have all of these on my website. Let me tap this. I've only got the one right now because the other ones I'm still working on, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but freely available. All of my stuff is under attribution share alike. So I don't care if anyone uses any of my stuff. I'm fine with that. Let me see what, let me pick up where I left off. Yes, yay. Okay. So if you're looking at making something of your own like this, I would focus on a case or a story that's local. I think local is the answer in a lot of ways or something that you know was really interesting in your area. Um, older is usually better just because you know there are gonna be people who are emotional about it even 40 years later, 30 years later. Um, my focus is on primary sources and kind of reminding patrons what that is. Some of them probably learned it in elementary school like I did elementary and middle school, but also maybe not. And it's also been a long time for some of them. Uh, so I like to use it as an opportunity to explain the difference between primary and secondary sources and how something that is a primary source for one issue might be a secondary source for something else. So you know, somebody's testimony recorded on court TV is primary source for that trial. But in terms of the crime, it's, it's not, you know, it, you're getting a witness account. Um, I also try to keep information literacy keys in mind. Um, I play around with the ACRL framework, which I know is more academic, but it really does have some cool stuff like one of the one of the tenets of it is that authority is contextual authority is constructed and contextual and i really love that idea because it really sums it up that we all agree that somebody who has this amount of training is a doctor and is therefore allowed to help us with our health so it's this idea that, you know, in a lot of ways, we come together as a society and we make the rules. Um, but it also is interesting in terms of dealing with cults or um, anything like that. You know, this idea that there is a group that, you know, is separate from society, but their context and in their society that they've constructed, this person is the authority. And that's where it gets tricky because not all authorities are created equal. Um, you can be the most ingenious lawyer in the world. I still don't want you operating on my heart. Like, I want somebody who is, you know, an expert in that area. Um, basically, it's just walking patrons through the case or the story and focusing on the evidence and what they mean, um, what each item means, what, you know, and kind of keeping opinions out of it for the most part. It was just more shocking to me because it's just so, it's so different than how we handle things today. I mean, you can look at the Britney Spears situation and that's a good example of, you know, how feelings about things have changed. And then as always, I recommend providing a detailed bibliography so that way people can see the evidence for themselves. So, Another one that I'm interested in um, that I'm working on is the Alan B. Farrow documentary. I don't know if anybody's seen this. It's very interesting because again, it was one of those things I saw in the tabloids as a kid and I did not understand. I thought I was very confused by the whole Soon Yi Previn thing with the Dylan Farrow thing. It was, it was just very confusing to a like 10 year old sonnet. Um, but so essentially, you know, giving some background, Dylan Farrow, um, which all of maybe maybe have heard of Ronan Farrow, if not Dylan Farrow, uh, when she was seven years old, she claimed her father molested her in her attic. Um, but to add to that confusion, me and Woody had been together about 12 years. 
And apparently around that time, he broke up with Mia Farrow for Mia Farrow's other daughter, who was nine when they met, but was 22, allegedly, when the affair began. And I say allegedly because the documentary did share some interesting, um, interesting points. So one of the big things, you know, if you're looking at somebody's, um, somebody making an accusation, if they haven't changed their story, that's usually a good indicator that something's going on. Um, contemporaneous notes comes into this again. Um, she recalls a toy train in the attic and the whole gotcha thing is that the brother says there was no toy train in the attic during that time. However, police reports that were taken at the time, notes that were taken when the abuse was reported, said there was a toy train in there. And so it kind of plays into that memory situation where memory can be a very tricky thing. And I will tell you, I'm from Louisiana. I'm a huge Saints fan. And in my mind, I remember the Saints barely winning the Super Bowl. That is not true. I've been told repeatedly that is not true. My memory is of the game that got us to the Super Bowl. But I would swear to you, like in my gut, that is the truth. I know that memory is not right, but that's how memory is. Like it's very easy to say, oh, well, this wasn't the case. This was the case and have it be false. And that's why having something like a police report taken at the time makes such a difference. Um, because whether or not there was a train in the attic probably wouldn't have been on Moses Farrow's mind as much as it would be on Dylan Farrow's, you know, in terms of what was happening at the time. Like, you know, why would you notice something like that if you don't have a reason to? There's also testimony of a nanny that supports some things that were not so kosher um, with Woody Allen and Dylan Farrow. And there's also testimony of his doorman, his building manager, and his housekeeper that actually corroborate the claim that he had a sexual relationship with Sunyi Previn for a long time before he left Mia Farrow. So actually, uh, the timeline would have been when she was still in school. So not making a judgment one way or another, not saying anything one way or the other, but you have people testifying to this and um, actually um, verifying this. So I'm still working on identifying, locating and compiling all the appropriate primary documents um, and making it into a narrative that can be used in, in programming. Um, and then I have to, of course, make my bibliography. But if you haven't watched the documentary, um, the Rolling Stones article is also a good, a good source for that. Um, and like I was saying, you know, other options for critical thinking, you know, looking at the social issues such as sexism, um, how defense attorney Abramson was treated, um, how the Menendez claims of rape were treated. I think now they're treated a little better than they were even 20 years ago. Um, but when you're looking at something like Allen versus Farrow, you know, Mia Farrow was portrayed in the press as a crazy lady. And she was almost, um, almost the fact that she adopted so many kids was treated as kind of like a symptom of mental illness, I would almost say, uh, kind of like she's a crazy cat lady, but with adopting children. Um, and then even the narrative of Sunyi Previn, where she's the younger woman, and he just fell in love with the younger woman. And it's kind of icky, because he knew her when she was nine. So is it a case of a younger woman falling in love with an older man, or is it a case of grooming and, you know, those complicated issues? You could look at a case like um, the People versus O.J. Simpson, but I feel like that case is still very polarizing and still kind of complicated. I also like comparing some of this stuff to literature, like especially if you want to deal with banned books um, and something like Allen versus Farrow. Uh, does lend itself to comparisons with Lolita. Um, you know, the accounts of Woody Allen's behavior and, um, and 
what he says versus what eyewitnesses say, you know, kind of reminds you of Humbert Humbert, that unreliable narrator. Um, and a lot of people read the book and don't realize you're not supposed to believe the main character. You know, he's he's not a reliable narrator. This, you know, this is not a consensual relationship. Um, and much how he portrays himself as a victim, you know, Alan kind of portrays himself as being, as Soon Yi being the one who pursued and being the, you know, like he was helpless against this, you know, beautiful young woman. And um, part of me felt like after reading Lolita, I had a better understanding of how predators, especially um, predators against younger people kind of work. Like in their mind, they're not, they're not the bad guy. They're never going to be the bad guy. And they're never going to say they're the bad guy. It's always going to be, well, she came on to me. Yes, but you're an adult. You can stop that. So it can open up some very interesting discussion. But it can still be too polarizing. And to me, the solution to that is going further into the past. I know it's back to the future, but technically he went to the past more than he went to the future. Um, some things 30 years later are still too polarizing. I mean, I lived in San Antonio for a couple of years and there was a documentary that said um, Davy Crockett didn't die at the Alamo and people lost their minds. So that was, you know, a long time ago and they just still lost their minds. So I understand not everything is safe to try to discuss in a public library in terms of not, you know, upsetting people or not um, traumatizing people or even just trying to have a discussion. You know, some people are just not gonna be open to a discussion about some of those things. So, Another thing you can do is just go really, really far back and hope that nobody cares too much whether Lizzie Borden did it or didn't do it. Um, so this is another one I'm working on, mainly because I think a lot of people don't know, or in my experience, I will talk to people about this and they will either not know who Lizzie Borden is, which surprises me, or they'll actually think that she was convicted of murdering her father and her stepmother. And she was never convicted. She was, um, she was found not guilty. And some even speculate that maybe she was innocent of the crime after all. I have no idea. That's not my point. But I think, you know, if you present true crime and how to analyze evidence and how to analyze testimony and, um, you know, how to analyze this person said this. Okay, well, what were their motives? What, what motive might they have to lie? Or do they have no motive? And, you know, they are probably being honest about it. So this is one that I'm very interested in working on and I haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, but I did I listen to a podcast that did say they thought maybe, and I have no idea how true this is, Maybe Lizzie Borden wasn't the guilty party. Maybe it was this person who was riding around on trains axing people. Again, I don't know. But I think it's an interesting theory. I think it's something to explore. And I think it's, it could be a fun kind of whodunit program to have in the library where everybody is already dead. It doesn't make a difference anymore, honestly. And you can kind of look at evidence and, you know, how sexism plays into it, whether it's, you know, looking at the, the unmarried daughter as, you know, hating her mother, her stepmother, or looking at, oh, a woman couldn't have done this violent crime. You know, it's one of those where the sexism cuts both ways. There's also um, some other cases, mostly from the 90s, were, um, Amy Fisher, where she, I think she went to jail briefly for shooting her lover's wife, but she was 18 when this happened. And at the time, everybody just seemed to skim over the fact that she was like 16 when, um, I think his name was, it was Buttafuoco, Joey, Joey Buttafuoco um, started his affair with her. 
And, you know, looking back on that, the idea that a 40 something year old man is having an affair with a 16 year old girl, you know, that's, that's not consensual by today's standards. That's not, you know, and so it makes a lot of, it's interesting to look back on it and look at what it was like at the time and then look at what it is now and compare how different we see things. Um, Lorena Bobbitt is another one where, you know, the jokes about Lorena Bobbitt at the time and, you know, again, that, oh, she's claiming abuse to get away with it. And then years later, you hear, no, there were documents that proved that she was abused. Um, he was violent with other people. This was completely in his character to be violent. Um, so it's very interesting to look at those. And of course, because I'm from Louisiana, um, the shooting of UEP Long, mainly because I think nobody, well, I'm sure some people believe, but it's a lot like JFK for the rest of the country where what was the real story? Um, and I'm not sure there was any grand conspiracy. I think, I think there's a good chance that some of the shots were from his own men, just in the confusion, um, his own um, security forces. So friendly fire and whatnot. But I want to do something on that because, you know, that's a big, a big thing in Louisiana where, you know, you grow up and you say, yeah, we know what happened, but do we? So. Are there any questions? I got a small list if you're okay. ready for questions. So first one, how do you not slip into revisionist history when you're talking about these past cases? Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard because even um, with the Menendez one, there was a brief moment where I kind of wanted to be like, yeah, yeah, they were abusive and, and they were terrible and, and the boys were just defending themselves. And to be honest, I'll give you my honest opinion on that one. I think the evidence shows, you know, they did murder their parents. They did try to set up an alibi. And after the parents died, they went on shopping sprees. They, you know, there was evidence of feelings of guilt. I believe it was the younger son who confessed to the therapist who, get this, was recording it so he could share it with his mistress. I, it, it, the whole thing's a hot mess. Like, it just really is a hot mess. Um, so he broke his, um, his client-patient confidentiality, which is why he was able, part of why he was able to break it later. Um, but for the most part, you know, they are spending money, which is something, I guess, that you would do if you're rich and, you know, you're grieving. But also some of it probably, um, you know, I, I don't think it was pure, I don't think it was pure fear. The father had threatened to write them out of the will. Um, and he'd done that before, but this time I think he was a little more serious about it because they were trying to live their own lives and wanted to exert control over their own lives as young people want to do. And I kind of feel like maybe the sexual abuse was part of it, but I also feel some of it was, you know, I put up with this, I deserve the money. You know, I put up with you doing this to me, I deserve the money. And so I don't think they were purely altruistic motives, but they were definitely the motives of somebody who, or people who had been twisted by abuse. Um, and so they're not innocent. They should have gone to jail. I just, you know, looking at it, I don't think it was the, oh, we killed our parents and then made up some scenario about abuse and then ran their names through the mud. And so I think that part's unfair. And I think probably they probably should be out of jail by now, like if they seem to be re rehabilitated, especially. But, um, you know, it's hard because I can't help but wonder if there's another, you know, the metaverse, if there's another universe out there where they are the Serena and Venus of the tennis world, the male Serena and Venus. And they, you know, become tennis champions and, you know, 
we find out about the horrible things their father did and you know the father goes to jail like you know but it, it takes a lot of sitting there and knowing your bias and having to go through it again and again like you have to be really diligent and i'm not saying i did it perfectly but you have to kind of balance that you know focus on the facts and you know what they mean well you mentioned bias so this kind of ties straight into the very next question we got do you use a media bias chart or something similar to teach media assessment i apps i actually do though it shifts it, um because the one that the, that's the most popular has shifted throughout time but i do like to use one um just to show and people will disagree with you like people will disagree with you. They will sit in the class and be like, no, Fox News is not on the right, it's true news. And you're just like, okay. Um, but what I've had a lot of luck with is local news. I highly recommend if you are teaching anything to do with fake news um, or you know, identifying false information, they may not believe the New York Times. I mean, I've had people who do not believe the New York Times is real news. But if I can show them that the Times Picayune says it's not true, which is our one of our local papers, then they're fine. And they'll be like, all right, if this person says it, then I believe them. So my my advice would be to not try to argue, not try to get them to necessarily agree with you, but try to meet them where they are. If you can find something that they agree is real news and you agree is real news, start there because you know, now we have people claiming the Washington Post and the New York Times are fake news. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> right. Do you have a list of learning outcomes for these sessions? I do. Actually, I sent that to, if you don't mind sending that out, the, the sheet that I sent you, April. Um, right. what, I try to, what I try to do is I try to have them, you know, make the connections um and um basically i want them to have an interesting time but i also want them to think about things and think about how you know we progress as people but then we don't go and look at things that we thought 10 years ago when we were a different person and so i like the idea of um getting people to do that and to look back and be like, oh, wow, I thought that person was terrible, but really, you know, I was just biased against them because of where I was in my life, you know. Okay, so I just put those um, objectives in the chat Wonderful. so people can look at that. All right, how far back are you willing to go with true crime stories? Is there um, I don't know. I'm like, how far back, how far back are they thinking? I mean, there, there, there's some pretty famous cases, you know, way back. Caesar and Brutus. Yeah, I feel like, oh my goodness. Well, now part of me wants to, just to kind of <laughs> see if I can. Um, because I've heard, I've watched Ramsey. documentaries where people yeah. are like, oh, Caesar knew it was coming, but he was dying of something like Parkinson's and he wanted to be stabbed to death. And I'm like, mm -hmm. did he though? Like, um, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper yeah. is interesting, but I'm never going to be that person who thinks they solved it. Even though they say they've solved it now, I'm just like, I don't know. But I, I wouldn't mind looking at those cases and just um, playing around with that and looking at, you know, because a lot of people, I mean, it's so hard, you know, was he going after prostitutes because he had some kind of issue with them or was it because they were easy prey? And though I think he probably did have some issues with women based on how the crime crimes went. Uh, so when presenting these programs to the public, do you promote them as a true crime or do you come from the information literacy side or a combination of the two? Combination of the two, um, because I want to be honest, but um, I know the true crime is what's going to get the people in. So um, I'm currently, I'm 
I'm putting it as the truth behind true crime. Um, so like looking at, you know, things we thought we knew. Things we thought we knew 30 years ago that we now know, oh, that's not the case, you know, or the media, you know, sometimes it wasn't even the media lied about it. Sometimes it was, you know, a tabloid said something and it got loose and the next thing you know, it's in the newspaper, but the newspaper prints a retraction that nobody reads. Um, so there's a lot of misunderstandings around cases, especially back then when you had cable TV coming out and court on TV and Menendez was easy in the sense that everything's online, all the, all the testimonies online. So you can sit there and listen. Um, but, you know, there are going to be some that get harder and harder. And then there are some that I don't want to touch, you know, like Anita Hill. I know that I, I, I have my thoughts on that, but I also know that I'm probably not going to make any friends. Like I'm in a, I'm in a conservative area. Um, and just based on testimony for some of the more recent justices, that is still not something that people are willing to hear, even though I've not met any woman who has gotten rich off of accusing a man of sexual harassment. I've yet to, I've yet to hear of one woman, you know, getting rich or getting famous in a way that has not been detrimental to her life. So in what ways or how do you make patrons active participants in your classes? I would, I, I like to bring in personal stories. I like to um, talk about experiences and ask them their thoughts on things and, you know, have discussion points like, um, you know, okay, I'm not commenting on the nature of the photographs. I didn't think they ever existed. Now that you know they exist, what are your thoughts on that? Like, hmm. You know, and when you have the prosecutor saying things like, well, maybe, maybe it was a relative who thought it was a cute picture. Mm, okay, that's, mm, that worked in the court, but like, you know, that it, you can kind of get your gut involved and be like, oh, yeah, I would never, I would never do that. I would never think that was okay with my kids. So why would this be okay, you know, in the 70s? which I guess maybe it was a different time, but I don't think it was that different. Um, and then, you know, bringing in when it comes to fake news, I like to tell them stories when I've been duped or when I've almost been duped, um, just because then it's not me, the person who knows more. It's me, the person who's, who's been at the bad end of it, giving you advice, like helping you. It's not me, I'm not better than you. I'm just as fallible. I'm just as likely to be biased. I'm just as, you know, it may be different biases, but, you know, I have my own flaws. So how do you keep participants on track and not like getting into the weeds or into conspiracy theories? That can be hard. Um, what I like to do is say, you know, that's a very good, that's, that's an interesting thought. Let me get back to you on that. Um, but let's focus on this and kind of like, cause then you're not dismissing them because the worst thing you can do with a conspiracy theorist, I think is dismiss them because then you're part of the conspiracy. Um, at least that's been my experience where they're, you know, then they, they think you're part of the man. Um, but I've, been fairly lucky in that I'm usually able to get them back on track and I'm usually able to say that's a good story but let's get back to this before you know before we uh, lose our train of thought um, and so that's been my success. It kind of tied to that do you find most people are able to be convinced when you present the facts of a case or does it just depend on the individual? I think it depends on the individual. And I think probably, I mean, there's a statistic that says um, when people are given the facts, they still believe what whatever they believe. I, I'm not saying it.
even if it can get them thinking that, hey, that's kind of messed up that, you know, they made fun of these boys who were talking about sexual abuse on SNL like 30 years ago. Like we thought that was funny back then. That's weird, you know, because mm-hmm. um, it's so easy. You hear about the good old days and can't say that today. And it's like, well, it was always terrible. You're just now realizing how terrible it is. Um, so if I can at least get them to think about that or think about the fact that just because the prosecutor says it doesn't mean it's true, you know, just get them to open their world a little bit. Maybe it's something. So do you do current um, things too, like the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard case? No, I'm afraid to touch that one. Um, I, I feel like people are very raw about things and especially if it's, well, A, in the current, I mean, maybe eventually after all that pans out, if, if all the testimony's online, but it's so easy to start from a certain premise and then have it end where, you know, oh, everything I thought was true was not true, you know, um, or letting bias seep in. With the older stuff, it's a little easier to be removed. It's a little easier to be like, you know, because I'm dealing with what I think now versus what 10 year old Sonnet thought. So it's like 10 year old Sonnet didn't know anything. She just saw, you know, tabloids in the grocery store and maybe caught a little bit of what my mom was watching on TV in between playing, you know. Um, Whereas now it's hard to, it's hard to not be biased because you have all the news outlets and some not news outlets just saying everything and then trying to track down what's true and what's not true. um, I just feel like current is a way to get fights started. Have you ever, pre- uh, do you only present this to adults or have you taught it as a research workshop for high schoolers? I have not. I wonder if, 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 uh, if high schoolers, are, are high schoolers interested in true crime? I'm going to have to look around my, na- my uh, library and see if they're interested. I would totally teach them how to do research from the perspective of we're looking at true crime if they'd find that interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Well, I have a 19-year-old and a 20-year-old. And yes, <laughs> uh, my ch- especially my Otis, ever since she's been about 13, 14, she has devoured true crime. She's, I think, seen every SVU and CSI episode in existence. Oh, my goodness. Well, and it, it's also interesting because um, when you read podcasts, I mean, read podcast, listen to podcasts, and even if this is all that a patron gets from it, there are times I'll listen and someone will say something and I'm like, okay, well, how do you know? How can you possibly know that? You're just making that up. You have no way of knowing. Um, and so it at least gets you to kind of listen to stuff and be like, yeah, okay, you're saying this happened, but you have no proof that's what happened. You just have a feeling. Um, that's not, you know, that's, you know, that's a good story. And maybe that is what happened, but I'm also not going to hate this person because this podcaster said, oh, she must have been having an affair. Like, is there evidence? No. Okay, move on. So if, even if it just gets them to question what they hear and what they read a little bit and not just assume, you know, everything they read online is true. At least I'm making a little progress. Do you mind putting the link to your slides in the chat? Absolutely. Let me, to this presentation or the, um, or the, uh, let me see. Oh, actually changed anyone with the link. Done. Copy link done. Now I got to find the chat. Thank you. And I have one more question. So if you guys get more questions, you can start sending them. How do you deal with the bias that's in these documentaries? So I know the documentaries are yeah. generating a lot of interest, but there's also bias with those. That's the, that's the rough part because you really have to look it up yourself. Um, there was one I watched about, uh, what's his name? Waco. Um, David, David Koresh. Koresh. Yeah. And 
it took me forever to go through that because I was sitting there and I was so mad because it essentially was from the perspective of these terrible federal agents were messing with this peaceful community. I'm not saying the FBI handled it perfectly, but he was, he had babies with a 12 year old. Like, can we, it just felt like, well, he wasn't stashing guns. Yeah. But he was like, does no one care about the 12 year old? Um, so it's very frustrating because sometimes you'll watch something and you'll just know that that seems wrong. Um, and I'm all for trying to balance things and, you know, say that, you know, maybe this wasn't the way to handle it, but at least, at least acknowledge, you know, the bad parts. Don't just, you know, say, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. I mean, the parents approved. Okay, if the parents approve you beating a child half to death, that the parents would still be arrested. Like, um, so yeah, it's, um, I forgot what the original, oh, keeping it, basically it's verifying everything, just verifying for yourself because you have no way of knowing if they're leaving stuff out or not. Um, and then reading articles against the documentary, that helps a lot um, because you can kind of tell when one is written by someone who hasn't watched it or, you know, and then you're like, well, that's no help, but at least you, you have an understanding that's coming from an emotional response and not from actually watching and looking at the ed ev ah, evidence. So, so are you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Are the classes one-offs or do you do a series on a single case? Because there's quite a bit of discussion of how can you cover all of this in 90 minutes? I try to, I try to keep it to 90 minutes and have it be a one-off. Um, but I do, um, like, I, I wouldn't necessarily go into my thoughts as much. Um, so it'd be strictly focusing on the evidence. Um, one thing I don't have in the presentation that I didn't mention is that was also horrendous. Just going to share this. Um, in the Menendez trial, the first one, you actually had one of the prosecutors berating one of the, one of the kids, kids, one of the guys on, um, on the stand and, and saying that he was really gay and that's where he got this all from. So I keep that out of it because it's like that serves no purpose except, but it's one of those things where, you know, it really irritates me that it's like, oh my God, can you imagine someone doing that today? Like that prosecutor would be ruining their lives, um, rightfully so. Um, but it's hard and you have to, like, you kind of also go with the audience you kind of let the audience take you where you go. And if, you know, if you have an area where they're not that interested in the history as much, you try to do that a little more briefly. Um, if they want to watch a little bit of the video, you kind of, you know, shorten something else there. Um, so 90 minutes is how I try to keep it because it's really more just a taste and then let them, you know, think about it and then they can um, explore more on their own. Do you have something that shows the new re news resources that you would recommend? Oh, um, well, I have access to, uh, through one of my local libraries, the St. Tammany Parish Library, which is where I live, they have a historical database of the Times-Picayune, which is our local paper, one of our local papers. And so I've relied heavily on what they have. And a lot of it has been, um, for this, has been using court stuff. Um, you know, like um, legal documents. Um, let me pull up. Of course, court TV was a lot for this one. Um, and, as, and of course, with this one, there were actually people, like there are actually people who have um, websites dedicated to, um, to the Menendez brothers that then links you to other stuff. So I used a lot of court TV. And then I actually, um, there were a couple of book reviews I like, you know, that directed me to the, the juror, the juror number nine book. Um, and then like the Menendez, the Terhoon, I still don't know how to say that, um, was actually a case. And I actually, um, heard about it and I think I started googling it and found the United States Court of the Ninth Circuit and started searching that way so a lot of it was just looking for 
which court it was in and trying to find it that way. Um, but in terms of new stuff, um, you can go to places like newspapers.com. Um, Google has some news stuff that was helpful. Um, but a lot of this one was focused on like listening to the actual testimony. So it was a lot of court TV, which I'm sure when I do something like Lizzie Borden, it's gonna be a lot more old newspapers. So I'm gonna have to find, um, find some databases and, and figure out how to find those records. Do you address cases that include law enforcement falsifying evidence or coercing uh, confessions? I have not yet. Um, I kind of want to, because there's a case and I don't remember the details of it. It was a documentary or a, maybe it was just a crime show I watched. And literally I've used it in my fake news class. Literally they accused this guy of raping this woman um, who I think lived in his apartment complex and his, they got him to confess. The DNA didn't match. So they said, you didn't do it alone. So he brought in another guy. They get him to confess, even though at first he says he didn't do it. Get him to confess. DNA doesn't match. Must have been another guy with you. This goes on till there are, I kid you not, six guys involved. The DNA comes back. It matches this guy. I don't even, he has no connection to anyone. He's, um, you know, he was just some guy with a criminal record. Um, and Latino for the purposes of all the other guys are white. So the theory of the crime at this point, his DNA comes back. The theory of the crime is that these six men were in the parking lot about to go rape this woman. And they ran into this man they never met before and said, hey, we're about to rape a woman. Want to come with us? And he said, yes. And they all went to jail. And I'm just like, no, that's stupid. And it was so bad that one of the guys actually became convinced he did do it. Like he just wasn't mentally stable enough. And like their interrogation, he got convinced that maybe I did do it. Maybe I blacked out and I did it. But it was just such a ludicrous idea that these six white guys are gonna randomly run into this guy and be like, we don't know you, but we're about to commit a heinous crime, come along. So I'm tempted, but I also am like, how, you know, I, I want to also not put my library uh, in danger of not getting its millage passed in a few years. One last question, and then we're going to call it. Do you give out handouts with your workshops? If so, what do you include on them? I do. Um, too much. I include too much. Um, with my fact or fake classes, I used to give people like the know your bias handout, the logical fallacy handout, the, the handout from the um, IFLA about how to spot, like I gave them everything plus a six page packet that had how to identify different spams. And I love handouts and I feel like I love them a little too much. I think I overwhelm people. But um, for this, I think I would probably, it would be focused on um, the bibliography and focused on the resources that I think they should look at. Like, hey, take a look at this link, take a look at that link. Um, but yeah, in general, I'm a big handout fan because I can take it and maybe I'll never use it, but at least I don't have to, you know, try to hunt for the information. All right, well, thank you. This has been wonderful. Chat's on fire. I'm gonna send out chat too. I am going to send out a recording of this video. I'll make a list of all the resources that popped up in the chat, lots of podcasts, books recommended. And I'm also going to send out links to your slides and to your workshop handout. That way everyone has all of this. So thank you, everyone. And thank you so much. This is awesome. You did a great job. Oh, thank you so much. And if anybody um, wants to contact me, I'm putting my um, my email in the chat, um, but I'm also easy to get a hold of. You can just Google me and you'll find me. There's no hiding. <laughs> All right, thank you again. Thank you.